Hi, and welcome to the Macro Show. We talk macro, and you wonder if bonds can still go parabolic or if the bond show is over. We're going to talk about the repo market and what those negative yields mean for the bond market. We're going to revisit the hot topic, which will come up in a little over a week and a half at the next FOMC meeting. What's going to happen with the SLR rule? Is it really as bond bearish as everyone says it is? As a market interprets, we're going to revisit that. You're, we're also going to cover the economic data, and you're going to learn what Martin North and I talked about on the show on Wednesday, which I'll link in the description below. Is the negative effects of QE going to, going to damage the labor market permanently? Will all these jobs we lost come back? Is it even possible? I'm going to show you the evidence that says probably not. We'll look at banking data and all kinds of other good stuff. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today. As we started out, the big hot topic right now is there's negative yields in the repo market. What does that mean? Well, let's take a look. Here's a great article on Yahoo Finance from a couple days ago. And it talks about the 10-year repo rate. So what happens is the Fed sells notes into the market to fix shortage, which is odd considering the Fed is also doing QE to mop up oversupply. But yes, there is a shortage in the bond market. That's what this implies. Let's take a look at this article from Reuters. And it says the cost of borrowing U.S. 10-year treasuries in the overnight repurchase or repo market went deeply negative on Thursdays as investors sought to short the notes, causing market stress. Yes, we already know there's massive amount of shorting going on here. Negative rates in the repo market, which is important to the financial system, with trillions of dollars in short-term loans. So what a repo loan is a very short-term loan where someone would post a treasury security for cash uh, or in the opposite direction of reverse repo is where the Fed would loan someone a treasury security for cash. So they're very short-term loans and not generally more sometimes they're just overnight can be you know a few days or more partially reflect uncertainty about how long the federal reserve will keep its easy monetary policy well we learned uh last this week that until the labor force participation rate goes up or jay powell loses his job and someone else replaces him it's going to keep monetary policy easy so there's more market stress right now because the market is very volatile said scott uh, Skyrim, Executive Vice President at Curvature Securities. The negative cost to came to cost to borrow came as investors were shorting notes in a bet that U.S. Treasury yields would continue to rise on expectations of increased issuance to finance the U.S. stimulus package. Because, as we know, the more debt does not equal higher interest rates. That is a big fallacy, but for some reason, investors don't know that. And optimism on prospects of a recovery as a country emerges from the coronavirus pandemic, possibly, but the data is not that strong, not even close to that strong, and has boosted short positions on the benchmark U.S. Treasury note. The 10-year cost to borrow repo rate, which is typically positive, has been negative since Monday and hit a low of minus four and a quarter percent on Thursday, which is wild. The last time rates were this negative before this week was June 2020, before that March 2020. Remember what happened? Bond prices in March? Well, in case you're wondering, let's take a look at TLT here. What happened back in March during that repo stress? Whoops, let's go back a little bit further. Oh, yes, they shot up. Short squeeze. All right, so the Overnight rate still remains negative, and the repo market sees Wall Street's financial institutions borrow money from, from money market funds and other investors to pledge the treasury securities and other securities they own as collateral uh, repos. In lenders in repo markets typically include money market funds, insurance companies, corporations, municipalities, central banks, commercial banks that have excess cash to invest. And then they can very safely, with very little risk, make a little bit of excess interest. So here's the key. Negative repo rates occur when a particular collateral security becomes in demand. So 10-year, see in this mind, 10-year notes in demand. In this case, analysts pointed to the 10-year treasury or there's a reduced supply in the repo market. So there is such demand for 10-year that rates have gone negative. So in order to borrow these securities, buyers have to temp potential sellers with cheap cash or repo rate that is less than the general collateral repo rate. So on the other hand, dealers and depository institutions borrow cash against the long positions and securities to finance their net inventory and balance sheet position. So the, that tells us is there is a massive short position in the bond market. Now, as the title of the show today is, can 
treasury bonds, can bonds be the next GameStop? Now, if you remember, or even Tesla, remember Tesla was a heavily short stock as well. And what happened? All it took was a little bit of a push, perhaps from my new Royal Scepter, and to push the bond market and tip that domino to get a rally going in, a, in on the bonds, which would trigger a massive short squeeze. And that could lead to a parabolic move in bond prices, just like you saw well, back here in March. And as we find out in other periods, as we've looked at on the show before, if we go back, you can see bond prices can and do sometimes go straight up. Why? Because they're extremely popular to short because investors always believe higher interest rates are coming. And so why not short it if you know that's what's happening? And then when you're wrong, well, you've got a problem. So believe it or not, some investors actually turned to the Fed to obtain collateral on Thursday with a re reverse repo operation seeing $2.1 billion in demand from up from half a billion on Wednesday. So the Fed actually lent out 10-year Treasury securities. Isn't that amazing? The Fed dealt with the, the supply shortage by lending out more bonds so people could short them. That is wild. Of course, dealers are getting prepared for next week's treasury auction with 38 billion reopen a 10-year notes. So it'll be down from the last auction, I think, which was around 41 or 42 billion. So all eyes will be next week. Perhaps there'll be strong demand on that auction uh, to fill that gap. Now, what, a short squeeze is really interesting because if you look at what's going on with the Fed, and here we are on the New York Fed's website, the Fed is still purchasing bonds through QE. So as I've thought, there would be a point where you have so many people short, they can short no more. And what we're seeing in this negative repo rates is massive, massive short positions, maybe even bigger than we think they are. The fact that they're running out of 10-year treasury notes, which is boggling to me that that could even happen, just tells you how short this market is. But at the same time, everyone's short, the Fed's a buyer. Now keep in mind with the 30 or the long bond, the Fed is buying 10 and a half billion a month. The dealers on average are getting five, five and a half, yeah, probably five and a half billion from auction. If you look at these implementation notes, which we're not gonna pull up, but if you if you go to, let's see if we've got it back here, don't. Okay, so if you go and look at the implementation notes, you'll see that the dealers or the banks are selling the Fed 30 year bonds they bought in November of last year. That's how short the supply is. So when everyone says that, that interest rates are going up and there's all the supply in the market, well, what we're seeing in the repo market with repo rates going negative is no, there's a shortage of supply and the Fed's finally getting to the point where perhaps it can squeeze all of that supply. Now, how would that translate into a parabolic move in bond prices? Well, that's where you have to go to the move. Now, this is the VIX of of the bond market is called the move and you can find it at tradingview.com just type in uh, ticker symbol m-o-v-e and what you can see is bond volatility is rather high in fact it's unusually high and that means if people get flooded in money comes flooding in and shorts get squeezed well if you already volatility is already high that means prices could then jump and you can see bond volatility rise very quickly, which is exactly how you can get these big giant moves on securities like TLT, where if you look in here, where they just go boom, 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 and just ramp right up. That is what volatility is telling you can happen. And, and you can see the setup is great because we're in the position for a massive, massive short squeeze. And this is the last time that happened was in late March and bond volatility was high and you see how fast that position changed. Now imagine you're changing it from a massive, massive short position. All right, let's talk about the SLR, uh, which a lot of people believe means the banks are going to cut lending, going to cut deposits. That's gonna be a little hard for them to do. I don't know where people are gonna put their money. And they're gonna sell billions, apparently tens of billions of treasury securities. Now is this true? And we've gone and looked at this before, but we're gonna look at it from a different angle because again, in a little about a week and a half, the Fed's gonna to have to make a decision or maybe they're not, maybe they're just gonna let it go. But there's some things that don't make sense to me. And I think that's one thing about this show is we try to figure out if some of the stuff that everyone's saying does make sense. So let's start 
with this chart here, this is Treasury and Agency Securities. Now, if you go back, the SLR rule came in on September 3rd, 2014. It was suspended on April 1st, 2020. So I said, let's just look at the positioning between those two times. And here are Treasury and Agent Securities, non-mortgage-backed securities, as U.S. Treasuries held at all commercial banks. And they went from $600 billion and increased by almost 40% to $941 billion. Actually, more than that, isn't it? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm a little off, increased by 371 billion. That's quite a bit, over 50%. So look at that. that, that was with the SLR rule in place. Now, how about cash? Well, cash went down, but was that due to interest rates being a bit higher? Maybe other things going on in the economy? Possibly. I don't recall banks telling you you couldn't deposit money, but how about loans and leases? On a year-over-year -year basis, here it is, same period of time, we see loans and leases were doing fine through 16. So clearly there was no issue with the SLR rule. Now that decelerated down to around three to 4%, but the economy also slowed down in 2016. So that's not surprising. So in looking at this, well, so far that doesn't make any sense. And how about 30-year treasury yields, which everyone is saying yields are gonna go up. Well, here it is, the SLR rule. They were flat for most of the time and then went down. Well, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, even as they were flat, they barely went up hardly at all. They were spent more time chasing down than going up. And here you have the election that, that really drove yields up on the reflation trade. But overall, no indication here that the SLR rule leads to higher interest rates. And even if it did, okay, so let's just pretend for a fact for a moment that, yeah, this SLR rule is really bad. It's going to cause the banks to dump treasuries. So what would be the one thing that I would expect the banks not to be holding long positions in the futures contract, right? the futures pit, right? We wouldn't expect that. But yet, uh, courtesy of Brent Johnson of Santiago Capital, he sends us this, which we'll go over more on Monday. Well, speculators went more short, and banks went more long. So if you were working inside the banking system, right, and you knew that this was really, really bad, and that you were gonna be dumping tens of billions of dollars in treasury securities, why would you be still sitting on long positions expecting bond prices to rise and interest rates to fall? Why would you do that? Either it doesn't do what everyone says, maybe it looks like this and goes down, or maybe they have inside information to know the Fed is going to extend the rule and they're holding their positions. This is like I said, this is the one thing that doesn't make a whole lot of sense as to why everyone thinks this is so bad for the banks because we know the banks are, are largely sitting in the opposite end of this position. And particularly of interest is anytime you hear a bank CEO come out and say, short the bond market, you better believe you should just do the exact opposite. And what have we heard recently? Bank CEOs, I think it was uh, Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan Chase, could be wrong on that, came out and said, oh yeah, you short the bond market, short the 10 years, it's going higher. Never listen to what a bank CEO says, do the exact opposite because all they're doing is trying to load on more short positions, offshore positions to their actual client book to which then later they pull the rug out and you eventually see they've done it many times in the past. Oh, <laughs> look, hey, rates went down and it turns out we were holding the opposite end of that bet. What do you know? All right, let's take a look at the economic data here and uh, see what we can figure out what's going on. So Challenger job cuts, uh, this actually fell a little bit year over year basis. Uh, to minus 31.9%. That was a big drop from 17.4. But look at the cuts. They just, All the cuts did was drop from a, a very high, say 79,500 announced cuts to 35, a four and a half. And let's look at this. Let's zoom in a little bit to see, is this a normal uh, amount? And the answer is, yeah. So it's back down to a normal amount that you would see kind of in any given month. So that's a positive sign, but still a lot of people at the wrong time to have losing their jobs. All right, let's take a look at initial jobless claims. And for that, we'll jump over to the Department of Labor. And what we see is initial claims came in at 745,000. This is now the 50th consecutive week where claims have been over 700,000. That is I don't even know if that's ever happened before. How about total uh, claims, including all form of pandemic insurance, down a million to 18 million Americans on unemployment. Still a very, very large amount. I'm um, not too interested in the factory orders. It's uh, a bit behind us now in uh, January. We know, of course, uh, Fed Chair Powell's speech, that didn't go over too well. Uh, let's move into the payroll report. Now, keep in mind, if you're new to the show, the, the non-farm payroll report is probably the most faked report 
the government releases. And what happens is they will revise this uh, in the coming months. And then usually there's a major revision a year, a year and a half later is what they'll do. So we saw nine farm payrolls increase 379,000. Most of these jobs were in the uh, entertainment and hospitality. This would be, you know, waiters, waitresses, you know, uh, bartenders, things like that. These, these jobs generally pay about 40% less than other jobs. Uh, so most of this report was in lower wage jobs. But we've seen, you know, restaurants reopening indoor dining in certain parts of the country. So that's been a plus. At least some people are going back to work. But what the report didn't focus on was these average hours, weekly hours worked. Let's come back to this average hourly earnings were up 0.2%. The year over year trend is still at 5.3. So those who are working are certainly making more money. But average weekly hours work dropped from 34.9 to 34.6. Now you might think, well, that's not really a big deal. Well, if you translated this into a jobs, that's a million dollar, million job loss. So if you factor that hours worked got cut against an increase here, you actually had a net report of net minus 700,000. Now do keep in mind that in a liquidity trap, what should we see? Well, we can see people go back to work, but we might also see some people getting less hours or less pay. The whole thing has to eventually bounce out. So when you factor in average weekly hours, this report certainly was not as strong as it appears. Uh, the unemployment rate dipped to 6.2%, but the U6 may, remains high at 11.1. If you want to talk about an economic recovery, wait till this number is at 8% or less. So this is telling you there's still massive structural problem, unemployment problems, which I think we know from this show. Participation rate is at 61.4%. Percent that was unchanged. Now this is interesting, and I want to talk about the participation rate a bit because in the interview that Powell did on uh, Thursday, he talked. Uh, he was asked about you know what effectively what would it take to get you to you know raise rates and all that stuff, and he said you know look we, we could have a lot of jobs come back, but the key thing for him was the labor force participation rate. He says that's got to go up. So what is a labor force participation rate, and is it going to go up? Well, the answer is it's not, but let me show you what it is. So let's go to Investopedia. You know, if you're if you're ever trying to figure out one of these terms, go to Investopedia. It's kind of a great database. Uh, so what is a labor force participation rate? It is a measure of an ec economy's active workforce. The formula for the number is the sum of all workers who are employed or actively seeking employment. So if you are employed or out looking for, actively looking for a job, divided by the total non-institutionalized civilian working age population. So it just tries to determine of all the people who can work, who are either working or trying to work. That's all it's trying to do. So let's take a look at if this is actually coming back. So here's the labor force participation rate in red, and you'll appreciate I did turn off tooltips. I remember to do that. And what I did is I took the monetary base and I inverted it. That's why there's a negative sign there. And I did that because this shows us what the effects of quantitative easing is. And I want you to notice that as the Fed balance sheet goes up, that would be the monetary base inverted labor force participation rate goes down. And when the Fed stops doing a, a QE and even tighten it, then people go back to work. And then when the Fed increases the monetary base, people lose their jobs. Now you could argue that this is coincidental due to the Fed's response to the pandemic, but the following part is not. So you see the labor force participation rate has came back up and has slowly declined. And look at the monetary base. It is is falling, it's below its prior peak, suggesting that the labor force is not going to recover. The, the job market is not going to fully recover. It's not possible. Now we can carry that a little bit further because that the monetary base is only a monthly data point. But if you look at the cash assets at all commercial banks, which is where the Fed gets the cash or where the banks get the cash to buy, re create reserves, and then the Fed swaps those reserves and they'll go on the monetary base, you'll notice there's a very strong correlation here, as there should be. And so then when you take the cash assets at all commercial banks, invert that against the labor force participation rate, it tells you that yes, there are people that are gonna go back to work, and then what's gonna happen is there are other people that are gonna go look for a job and find out there are none. And so likely there will not be very much of a recovery and if you know this, that means, according to Powell, unless there's recovery in the labor force participation rate, QE will continue. Unfortunately, QE will also keep jobs from coming back. How about that? 
And if you take that labor force participation rate and run it against 30 year treasury yields, well, this is interesting because if people are not really working and there's a weak job market, yields go down. But yet everyone says right now, yields are gonna go up and look at the labor force participation rate. It, it's trending down, yields are up. And what happened? Every time yields have gone up and labor force participation rate hasn't fallen, they've come crumbling back down every single time. Now, what if you take that same data point and invert cash assets instead of the labor force participation rate, since you have that weekly data? Well, what you'll find is 30 year yields come crashing down every time. And look at that. The cash assets are saying that treasury yields are going to be massively reversed at some point. You know, it kind of looks like this picture here or right in here where labor force or where the cash assets are declining or rising, uh, declining, showed inverted, and yields come crumbling down. Some people say, well, how can you be bond bullish? Well, I can tell you this is one way I can be super bond bullish given what's even what's going on. All right, so let's see. Consumer credit in January contracted at $1.31 billion as consumers paid down their credit. Market was expecting a $12 billion increase. Well, we know that's not how it goes. All right, let's go on to H.8 and take a look at credit conditions. We've got bank credit rose about 40 billion. Securities and bank credit up 20. Mortgage-backed securities were up 19. Now, banks were really going to get rid of all these mortgage bonds due to the end of uh, the SLR rule. Why wouldn't they be dumping them now? Well, they only added 1 billion. I mean, they've hardly, at the peak, where were they at? Uh, 1.258 billion. And they're at 1.226, not a big drop at all. If, if you're going to shed tens of billions of these things, maybe they already did. Maybe that's it. How about loans and leases? All commercial banks up 20 billion. Commercial industrial loans a big winner here, uh, which surprised, again, surprising me. 14 billion, uh, up 14 billion. Residential real estate, which is the big one. This one's got a lot of money. You need re residential real estate really drives the economy down 5 billion commercial real estate flat consumer loans up to with all of that coming in the credit card space. How about cash assets at banks? That's down uh, a mere $5 billion. So that's kind of interesting. Cash seems to be king still. Let's take a look at the slide deck and see where all that translates into real estate loan growth down to 0.09% from a year ago. You know what doesn't get higher interest rates? Contracting real estate Loan grow. Look, I mean, every time real estate loan grow is going to go, uh, let's see, negative, you're going to get a rejection on, let's see, blue. Yeah, negative. Look what happens to 30 year fixed rate mortgage. They go down, not up. They go down. Why? Because if credit is contracting, how do you get people to borrow? Do you have higher rates or lower rates? Well, obviously, you need lower rates. So, in the notion that rates are going to continue to go up, they will be ultimately rejected as credit contracts. This month rate of change is negative. Three month rate of change is negative. Uh, how about commercial industrial loans? This has popped back up in the last two weeks because of an increase in lending there. Six month rate of change still is very much negative. Three month rate of change is slightly negative. Both are rising. Uh, by the end of March, we'll kind of get flushed through this uh, pandemic increase and see what the true story of this is. How about loans and leases? In bank credit, all commercial banks, growth rate is down to two point, I think that's nine one typo there. Six month rate of change is minus one and a half and falling. Three month rate of change is flat. How about credit cards? Look at the consumers. You know, we'll, we're gonna see more of this in, in the credit data on, and when it, the lagging data when it comes out in January, that hey, consumers paid off more debt. Look at that. Uh, this should say down to 12.5% from a year ago. No V-shaped recovery in the consumers. They keep deleveraging. Key continue to pay off debt. Well, anyways, there's one last thing we'll look at that confuses me about why people say the SLR rule is going to cause banks to deleverage. Is why are all these people buying down here? Why are we seeing the 30-year bond stay under 2.3%? If, if the insiders knew that banks were going to be dumping bonds, and they do, you would not see this. But so far, we have what appears to be a double bottom. We have the first bottom here on strong volume. And I'm, I, I will visit the Kingdom Archives. I will get my book out on technical analysis. This is not as strong as a second bottom as normal. I think the volume ought to be a little higher, but maybe it's bunched together over a couple of days. I'll look and see what the books say. And we'll report back on uh, Monday, of course, when we get back for the macro show. And then, uh, you, as you know, on Sunday, we'll be doing the chart show. I'm going to add more of that volume profile. I think a lot of you really like that. So uh, look for that update. And in the meantime, 
to the kingdom. We will survive. And everyone will be amazed. They'll be amazed. Anyways, I'm your host, Steve Van Meter. Have a great week. And see you on Sunday. Bye now. Content of this video is provided education information only. is not intended to provide this or other advice. It's still to be construed as a recognition of the by social security, financial instrument, or to participate in any particular training strategy. This video is prepared by Steve Van Meter. Personal capacity, pins expressed in this video that I do not reflect the view of Atlas Financial Advising or Steve Van Meter Financial.